So every dog has its day. Well, Helen's day has come, albeit uh, late, but better late than never. And uh, what have I got here? Got something on my... Speak a bit slower, I'll get I'm it sorry. more. Sometimes I have to, I feel like saying, well, that's Judy. excuse me. That's Judy. I speak too quickly. New York, New York. But she's got such an endearing smile, hasn't she? Thank you. And like uh, your friend, Judy, uh, uh, Deborah. Deborah, Debbie, yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, bless you. Okay, right. so let's, let's try this again. Today, let's talk about today's news. Yes. That Helen? Well, that is uh, the culmination of many years of, uh, uh, well, dis almost despair that she would ever be given the credit for having been such a gifted woman. Instead of that, she was imprisoned and she was persecuted and denigrated and called a fraud and none of those uh, names or words fitted the woman at all. She was such a simple lady. and uh, But her gift was unique. This century, there's been nobody like her in spiritualism been a lot of mediums, but they couldn't hold a candle to her. And yet she was the most humblest of people. She wasn't slick or clever or devious or uh, like a conjurer was, you know, uh, what do they call it, hand, uh, the quickness of the eye deceives the, the quickness of the hand deceives the eye, you know, that kind of thing. No, Helen just sat back and let her gift manifest. And believe you me, it was mind-blowing. When you see the things and you see the conversation between the spirit that's fully materialized, normal human being, talking to their loved one, and the, the two-way conversation taking place, reminiscing about days gone by, years gone by. Nobody in that room would know about all those things. But to listen to it uh, 30 times in one session, you know, 30 different people, all shapes and sizes. Mrs. Duncan couldn't imitate all those people and have the knowledge and the reminiscences that these people were able to share with their loved ones, you see. And it was a wonderful experience, riveting. And if, if I'd only had one, I couldn't speak with such conviction, but I had many occasions like that. And it never, it never, went, it wasn't off one day and brilliant another day, it was consistently good because her guide, Albert, was so proficient and professional and efficient, you know, and uh, he picked the right people out for the person that was coming. He said, there's a gentleman sitting on the third row or something like that, you're a third from the left. He says, there's a lady here for you, and in the end it would turn out to be his wife, and they'd be talking together, and they'd embrace before they... she said, oh, she won't be, she's got to go now. And they'd take, take each other in each other's arms. You've got to be there to witness it. The love and the spontaneous dialogue that takes place, there's nothing rehearsed about it or anything like that. There's nothing like the natural response to a loved one that you've not seen a long time. You're lost for words for a bit, but the spirit isn't lost for words. When my wife materialized to me, uh, I was lost for words, but she wasn't. She filled the empty gaps because time was precious, you see. Time was precious. Does it make you feel like today is the vindication finally? Oh, this been well, you know, that was my purpose of writing the book. It wasn't to be, I was not a scholar. I'd had a very elementary education, but life has taught me a lot and adversity and one thing and another does knock all the rough edges off, you know. <laughs> but the idea of vindicating Helen was the purpose of the book. From the slander, the gossip and everything else that still persisted 35, 40 years after her passing. And people still said talked of her as a cheat and a fraud and all that. Well, I had to write this book. Something to, in her memory and something I never dreamed it would reach the proportions it has reached recently, but it, that's taken 24 years. The book was written 24 years and it stayed in print for 24 years, which is a record, because most books, two or three years, and they go out of print, 
they've got to be re, uh, regurgitated, you know. But um, uh, in that way, I think it was uh, um, a credit to the powers of Helen that she knew our motives were, were right and they were for her vindication and she would respond to that. So this campaign that's getting, taking place now is mainly the people responsible are Helen Duncan and others who deserve some kind of credit for the service they gave over many years, you see. I keep seeing something walking on my hand here. Yeah. It's gone now. Okay, now you want to talk about the archbishop? Oh yes, now uh, again that goes back 40 to 50 years. The Church of England set up a commission and the Archbishop of Canterbury headed this commission to investigate spiritualism and their findings were unanimously, unanimously in favour of coming out with this report that was in favour of cooperating with spiritualism because it had so much to offer. The purpose, the meaning of life and the purpose of death, or the purpose of life and the meaning of death. And spiritualism demonstrated there was no death. Let's take that from the top. So could you start in, in whatever year it was? Oh, uh, 50... 37, sorry. 30, 1937. Actually, it was further back than that than I thought. I thought about 1950. I'm going on just memory or something. But 1937, so it was a long time ago. But that was published. Uh, they finally, well, they suppressed the report because the majority of churchgoers would have been, oh, fancy having anything to do with spiritualism. They were worrying about the public's reaction. So they suppressed it. In other words, truth wasn't important. <laughs> as long as it was popular with the public in their ignorance, really. They were pandering to ignorance. But anyway, it remained suppressed. And then in recent years it was published and they released it. It was a bit late in the day, but they said that greater cooperation with spiritualists would be not only beneficial, but would inform people uh, of the reality of the, the Gospel, the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus. Jesus did all the things. He turned water into wine, he healed the sick, he manifested three days after his crucifixion to his mother, and he say, said, just said the word Mary. His mother thought it was the gardener. She turns round and she, she recognises Jesus. That's a materialisation, like Mrs Duncan did. People know their own wife and their mother and father. You don't have to think hard. When you see that, as soon as they speak, your voice is individual to you. There's nobody in the world got a voice like you. And I'm the same. We're all unique in our own right. So you recognize your loved ones. And when you love them, that love doesn't go. It's still there. And when you see this, when you have this experience of being reunited, albeit temporally, my wife said to me, don't worry, she said, love, we'll be reunited one day. But you've got to soldier on a little bit longer yet because you've got work to do this side. And I, I agree with her. Uh, if I have to do it, I, well, so be it. I'm not whining or complaining or anything like that because I know I'll get looked after. And our friends in spirit do look, at, look after us. Love is, still is there and they're concerned for our welfare and well-being. And that's why many of us manage to get scrape through some difficult times. We, we think it's coincidence or something.